Okay, so now the uh, Women in Cell Biology Medal Lecture. Uh, this year uh, has been awarded to Victoria San Moreno uh, for her beautiful work on cell migration and uh, invasion in cancer uh, over the past uh, years during her career. So I'll briefly talk about her career and then she can uh, uh, carry on the show. Um, she did her PhD in Spain in uh, the University of Cantabria, and then she came to the UK to do uh, her postdoc at the Institute of Cancer Research. And she was there supported by a Cancer Research Fellowship and a Marie Curie Intra-European Fellowship. Uh, she's uh, now a, a group leader uh, at the Randall Div Division of Cell and Molecular Biophysics at King's College in London. And uh, she has received um, a, a, a career development fellowship from Cancer Research UK uh, to, to continue to, doing, um, to do her research. And more recently, she has been awarded, uh, just last week, a senior fellowship from Cancer Research UK. And, uh, and now I would like um, to award the medal to uh, Victoria for her beautiful work and... Uh, quite heavy for the neck, <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so I'm looking forward to this talk, and um, congratulations again. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, an absolute honor, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for this uh, award. So <coughs> I hope I don't disappoint with the talk. <laughs> And um, I, I'm just going to try and, and explain to you today the work that my lab has been doing trying to connect the actomyosin machinery to transcriptional responses uh, in the nucleus uh, in order to sustain cancer migration. And this is a big uh, um, unsolved question because uh, cancer cells can be migrating for long periods of time uh, during metastatic dissemination, which is what um, kills, unfortunately, 90% of cancer patients. So. Um, it has become clear in the last 10, 15 years that cancer cells, but also normal cells, can use a wide array of uh, migratory strategies. And uh, I point out here just a few of them. I'm sure that we're going to discover some more in the near future, but uh, you can retain additions and, and move as a collective strand, uh, as a bud, um, as multicellular streaming, but also as an individual cell. <coughs> and individual cells seem to be quite good for what, we, what it is uh, thought to be a blood-borne metastasis, because then um, you, you need to become a single cell to cross those uh, barriers. So the kind of important thing here is that cancer cells can switch between migratory modes, but also cells during development can use different strategies during immunity, immune responses, during wound healing. So I think this is important for uh, many biological systems to understand uh, how cells can change their machinery in order to migrate, depending on, on environmental cues. So one thing that probably cancer biologists would want to understand is how can we block uh, all kinds of migration? Because if they can switch and we only block one, then they can still migrate and metastasize, and this is still a problem. So we thought hard, and we read all the literature, our own work, other people's beautiful work, and it looks like uh, a pathway that could have uh, potential in, in being key for most migratory modes is the actomyosin machinery, which I don't have to introduce too much because Eva Paluk gave a wonderful talk yesterday. But once you have contractile force, then cells can migrate in different ways. And this contractility is uh, regulated uh, in many cases by this kinase, rho kinase, which in turn can be stimulated either by um, mechanical tension or by the small GTPases, uh, rho A and rho C. So how can we look at these migratory modes? We've chosen melanoma as a model system because it's a very invasive and aggressive cancer. And uh, it can do all of the strategies that I was telling you about. But they're really good at doing individual cell migration. So we use these collagen systems with these um, um, gels that we prepare in the lab in which we make sure that the collagen polymerizes, leaving 
uh, pore sizes that are very similar to what you would find in the dermis, which is where the melanomas will invade. So I hope you can see that we have an array of behaviors, but these two probably are the most extreme, and it depends um, highly on where this contractility is located. So if you have a, lot of contra a very high level of contractility that is located in, in the actin or co-localized with the actin cortex, you will have this, uh, what we call amoeboid uh, cells that actually, because of the high intracellular pressure, they put out these protrusions, which are blebs, which Eva has also characterized very nicely. And these uh, provide um, uh, force to move as well. On the other end of the spectrum, we have cells that they, they, they put or they locate their contractility in their additions and at the rear of the cell. Therefore, lower levels of contractility are required, but they're also important to retract the rear of the cell or to retract the protrusions. So we can see these behaviors in, in our collagen gels, and I hope you can see also that the matrix they arrange around themselves is quite different. But we can also see these strategies in vivo, and if you grow a melanoma that is labeled, what we can see is some two more heterogeneity. So in the intracellular part or in the <coughs> inner regions of, sorry, in the inner regions of the tumor, you will have more of this slower adhesive behavior. While in the invasive fronts, in contact with the collagen and the stroma, the preferred strategy will be this fast, uh, a little bit crazy uh, amoeboid behavior. When we look at patients, of course, this is a still information but, uh, because we cannot make movies, but we've looked now at 150 patients from hospitals from the UK, from Spain, and all the melanomas look the same. They can either have round cells in the tumor body or spindle cells in the tumor body, but once they reach the invasive front, they always round up. So there is some information in, in that invasive front that could be physical or chemical that is actually making the cells adopt this more contractile behavior. And we're trying to understand this, and, and we're not the only ones, of course. So many years of uh, research done in, in, in many labs um, have understood that contractility has developed mechanisms, signaling mechanisms, by which it can keep excessive addition driven by integrins, uh, lower, while if you have a lot of addition, it's not probably compatible with having lots of contractility. But of course, you can have a lot of intermediate scenarios. So what is next to understand if we now know uh, some of these key molecular players? Well, first, we don't know much about these signals, at least the chemical signals. And also, we don't know what it means to the cell to be in a very contractile state. So for that, uh, my lab decided to, do, to take advantage of omics approaches and generate kind of a fingerprint of a very contractile migratory cell using transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And in the sake of time today, I will focus on our transcriptomic studies, which uh, were uh, quite interesting. So after doing quite a lot of bioinformatics and identifying the nodes of the networks that are uh, part of these transcriptional changes, we found some important transcription factors that then we could study in vitro in our collagen systems, then in vivo in the mouse models, and then we could look at the uh, expression or activity of these transcription factors in patient samples using in immunohistochemistry, or since uh, we think that many of these mechanisms are transcriptional, we can look at the RNA levels in patient databases which uh, are, are also available, publicly available. So the first hint we had that actomyosin may hijack some very important transcriptional programs in order to sustain itself uh, was uh, shown in this work that I developed at the end of my postdoc in which we found that manipulating actomyosin using either ROC inhibitors, several ROC inhibitors, or blevistatin, or using cells that have lower levels of contractility, or we can even increase the contractility of cells just by plating them in a very stiff matrix, but in all cases, again, the bioinformatics told us that this pathway, the JAK-STAT pathway, is highly downregulated if you downregulate contractility. So this pathway, the way it works, these cytokines bind to the receptor, then activate this kinase, and then they activate this transcription factor that will feed back and regulate the expression of all of these genes. So since JAK was activating uh, this signaling network, we also found that the JAK-STAT pathway 
regulated back contractility. So if we want to break this kind of vicious circle, what we thought we could do is remove the GP130 subunit, and we did this in vitro, but we also did this in vivo. And I hope you can see here that all this fast contractile amoeboid behavior in the invasive front is very much reduced if we don't have GP130 in the cancer cells. But you can still see some movement of immune cells that are infiltrating the tumor because we've just removed this cytokine receptor in the cancer cells. So that invasive front seemed to us very interesting. And one of the major components of what melanomas are finding is collagen. So Jose in my lab wanted to understand what is the interaction with collagen with these very contractile cells? Because the field seemed to point out at the fact that um, fast amoeboid migratory movement did not uh, require a matrix degradation. So Jose did a bit of uh, uh, proteomics here looking at uh, matrix metalloproteases and what he could see using this cell line that is highly metastatic and very amoeboid and has doubled the contractility of this other cell line that is less metastatic and is only 50% uh, amoeboid, uh, is that there was an upregulation of all the uh, secreted proteases that he looked at. So <laughs> we looked at the collagen and how it was arranged around the cells. And what we could see is that there were big holes around the cells using different types of collagen. And of course, this could be because they're using the contractile force to push away the matrix. But why would they be making proteases if they're not going to use them? So Jose stained for, uh, with this uh, very nice antibody, which stains collagen only when it is unfolded and cleaved. And what he could see is that these amoeboid, highly contractile cells also generate collagen fragments. So they are probably pushing the matrix, but also diffusively degrading the matrix, which could be kind of a, a very efficient way of uh, matrix remodeling. So he wanted also to test that this um, upregulation of matrix metalloproteases did not only happen in this system of very metastatic versus low metastatic lines. So he looked at a bunch of lines we have in the lab that we've previously characterized as very amoeboid, and all of them had very high levels of MMP13 or MMP2, which are canonical collagenases. But the most striking uh, correlation between roundness and expression was with MMP9. I hope you see that there is a beautiful correlation between expression and secretion. And MMP9 is not a collagenase, it's a gelatinase. Hmm? Nevertheless, we see that in, in its uh, promoter, there is very, very high affinity binding sites for STAT3. And since we know that JAK STAT pathway co um, cooperates with ROC, it's not surprising that maybe cells that have very high STAT3 signaling are making lots of proteases. So we blocked the JAK-STAT pathway or ROC, and we could decrease both the RNA, but also the secretion of this matrix metalloprotease. But since it's, a it's not a collagenase, uh, Jose wondered what was it doing in these amoeboid cells? Could it be controlling cell morphology because there was this beautiful correlation with cell shape? So he knocked down MMP9, and he lost the roundness, and he lost the uh, activity of uh, myosin 2, which we measure by the phosphorylation of, of the light chain of uh, myosin light chain 2. And Jose had read as well that MMP9 can regulate a specific uh, biological responses without using its catalytic activity. So Jose <coughs> generated a mutant of MMP9 that cannot bind zinc, therefore cannot degrade gelatin, its favorite substrate. So when he gave this both wild type and the mutant form to less contractile and less rounded cells, they both rounded up and they increased their myosin activity. But when he used a very specific inhibitor for MMP9, he couldn't see any difference in uh, morphology or myosin activity or invasion in three dimensions, which he could see if he knocked down the gene, because as I told you before, knocking down the gene decreases contractility. So this is a non-catalytic function of MMP9. So how can a secreted factor control intracellular contractility? It has to bind to some receptor. And again, going uh, back to the literature, there was evidence that MMP9 can bind to CD44. 
So Jose did some colocalization <coughs> studies, and I hope you can see that in very contractile cells, CD44 nicely decorates uh, the surface of the cell, and so does MMP9. So when we lose CD44, not only we lose contractility, now MMP9 can no longer bind to the cell surface because it has lost uh, its anchorage. Importantly, we wanted to see if this is happening in patients, in melanoma patients. So what we could uh, assess again in a cohort of patients with our collaborators, Sofia Carigianis and Richard Murray, is that, again, melanomas, when they reach the invasive front, they round up. They're very po there is very positive staining for MMP9 in those invasive fronts. And the nice thing is that it really colocalizes when, uh, where uh, STAT3 activity is high. And this is an antibody that recognizes STAT3 when it's um, activated. So we think that MMP9 is regulated at the transcriptional level. So let's go back to the databases and look at the RNA from MMP9. And effectively, we can see an upregulation of the RNA, specifically and, and most strikingly in the metastatic lesions. So we removed MMP9 from melanoma cells, and we did some experimental metastasis assays in the lung, which is one of the main sites in which melanoma metastasizes. And we can reduce, um, uh, importantly, this lung colonization, even though uh, the, the levels of MMP9 are really high and it's very difficult to knock down. So if I express this, um, if, sorry, if I uh, expose this gel a little bit more, you will see that there is some MMP9 remaining. So I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about another area of interest in the lab, which is oxidative stress metabolism. And why is this? So one of the main uh, effectors or, or um, processes that is regulated by the small GTPase rack, of course, is actin dynamics. But another main effector is this complex, the NOx complex, which regulates uh, reactive oxygen species. So um, I had seen uh, quite a few years ago that when you decrease contractility with ROG inhibitors, you get a RAC activation because they kind of suppress each other. So Cecilia in my lab reproduced this data, and she saw that RAC activation is sustained over time. So if we have a lot of RAC in these cells now, is this going to affect uh, reactive oxygen species metabolism? So indeed, that is the case. Ceci used several rock inhibitors, uh, blevistatin, knockdown rock, or compare cells with um, double the contractility than these ones. And in all the cases, when you have low contractility, you have high reactive oxygen. And if you do the reverse and you give hydrogen peroxide to the cells, you will increase the reactive oxygen inside the cell. You will decrease their invasion. And this is because you're reducing rounding and you're reducing uh, myosin activity. So we wanted to test the, the opposite effect, give it antioxidants to these cells, to cells that are not very invasive and not very contractile and not very metastatic. And all the antioxidants we tried made the cells uh, round up, gain actomyosin contractility, and invade up to uh, seven times more. We think this is very important and scary because many cancer patients are taking uh, antioxidant supplements, so this could kind of not help at all. And in fact, two papers came at the same time as ours, showing in vivo giving antioxidants um, to, to mice that are growing melanomas increased the metastatic um, burden. So what's the cell sensing uh, after this uh, decreased contractility and, and uh, moderate increase in reactive oxygen? It's actually activating a DNA damage response that activates ATM, phosphorylates P53, and stabilizes it because it's protecting it from degradation from NDM2. And this happens with all the ROC inhibitors that we've tested. So the cell actually is seeing a little bit of <coughs> DNA damage, and it has to respond transcriptionally to this. Therefore, we looked at our transcriptomics data, and what we saw is an upregulation of genes that have to do or deal with ROS metabolism and DNA damage. And amongst them, P53 and PIK3 are uh, involved in both processes. So every time we decrease the contractility of the cells, we stabilize PIK3, and not only in this uh, cell line, but in all the cell lines we tested that had P53 wild type. 
So every time we use a rock inhibitor, we stabilize P53 and its downstream target, P3. So P3 is P53 inducible gene 3, which is upregulated if the cells are very, um, have very low contractility. So what happens if we remove it uh, from cells? Well, we can increase contractility indeed. The cells are now round, put lots of blebs, and they're very efficient at invading in 3D. But what is PIG3, really? So it's, it has dual activity. When it's in the nucleus, it's, it acts as a scaffold that can bind different DNA uh, damage repair components. But when it's in the cytoplasm, it can, it's an oxidative reductase that catalyzes reactive oxygen. So what Tathelia did, he overexpressed the wild-type version of PIG3 and induced some reactive oxygen in the cell and induced elongation or loss of rounding. And you see a loss of um, actomyosin contractility. But she also had a mutant that was unable to bind NADP, and this mutant could not produce reactive oxygen, therefore we could rescue contractility and cell morphology. So in this case, the catalytic activity is very important. So how does PIG3 really suppress contractility? There is a family of uh, raw inactivators, or raw gaps, Mm, that are actually reactive oxygen species sensors. So we screened for those, and we found that RGAP5 in particular, if it's not present in the cells, we no longer see the loss of rounding. It's completely rescued. And this is because no longer PIG3 can suppress raw activity. This is rescued by RGAP5. Therefore, we can rescue the loss in contractility. So we can put in our cascade RGAP5 downstream of PIG3 and upstream of raw rock and contractility. So is this important in vivo, which is probably the question that um, we want to answer. And this we did in collaboration with Eric Sahai at the Crick. And we grew tumors that have uh, the control cells or cells that overexpress PIG3 that we know suppress contractility. And I hope you agree with me that now the migration in the invasive front is very much uh, diminished. So we can suppress migration in vivo. Nevertheless, human melanoma patients have lost PIG3 expression in 55% of the cases or have very little expression in another 30% of the cases. Therefore, this mechanism is lost during the progression of melanoma. But the patients that retain PIG3, and we did these stainings in 164 patients, actually those cells are more rounded, as you would expect. So I'm going to switch to another um, ROS kind of um, um, inducing enzyme, which is NOX4, which is independent of, of RAC activity. But we got an interest on it, because we have a collaborator that is very interested in um, NOX4 in the context of, of liver fibrosis and liver cancer. So we co-supervised Eva, uh, Isabel Fagregat, and, and myself, and um, <coughs> using now as a model liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinomas. So what Eva found was that cells that are uh, in a state that we call more, more epithelial and retain e cadherin have very high levels of NOX4. While cells that, are, uh, that have lost e cadherin actually also lose NOX4. If we look in patients, the patients that, are, uh, that have grade 3, 4 tumors, which are very invasive, um, have lost or have more deletions of uh, the NOX4 gene. And what happens if we remove NOX4 then in the epithelial cells? So they start producing less reactive oxygen species, but they now start becoming independent. They don't form parenchymal structures. There is more individual cells in all cases, and this results in higher invasive <coughs> ability, but also what we call invasive growth. If you grow a spheroid and, and you let it invade into the collagen, NOx4 deletion actually results in a higher invasive growth capacity. So does this have to do anything with contractility. So we looked at the cells on collagen on our collagen systems, and what we could see is directly from being a part of a parenchyma, a parenchymal structure and epithelia, if you lose NOX4, directly the cells start making blebs, 
they gain contractility, and they are now very, very amoeboid. So if we put them to embed in 3D, we can see that they are actually uh, always using amoeboid strategies if we remove NOX4. And if we look at a, a cell line that has no NOX4 at all, it only embeds using um, amoeboid strategies uh, in three dimensions. <laughs> so how does NOX4 regulate contractility? We um, looked at the, some usual suspects that regulate myosin light chain 2 activity and upstream of rock, one of these sub, su, uh, suspects is ROSI. And uh, we can see that the cells with very low uh, NOX4 have very high levels of ROSI. And if you have high NOX4, you have lower levels. So it's inversely correlated in the cell lines. And you can knock down NOX4 and induce ROSI expression, or you can overexpress NOX4 and reduce the expression. So let's look at the patients. In the metastatic lesions, we have very high levels of ROSI that inversely correlates with NOX4. And those patients that have that profile, they have low NOX4 and high ROSC. Actually, they have a lower survival probability. So we kind of described, I think, a, a quite interesting um, uh, transition, which is epithelial to amoeboid transition, just by losing NOX4 expression, which seems to happen in, in the later stages of hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can induce uh, this um, blood-based behavior that seems to be very efficient uh, in vivo. So I will uh, finish with this um, last set of network um, data on, on transcriptional regulators of invasion, which Gaia uh, Camtelli um, performed in my lab, this study in which she looked at the transcriptomics data from very contractile cells. And not only STAT3 was very um, upregulated, um, but also um, some components of the SMAT pathway. So you can see that the very contractile cells express many genes that are regulated by TGF-beta. And indeed, in our panel of melanoma lines, they secrete high levels of TGF-beta. So now we went to the patients, and we looked at the transcriptional machinery that is downstream of TGF-beta, the SMATs and some of the um, adapter molecules like Smith or Cite. And what we found is that the SMATs are pretty constant in the, in, in the progression of melanoma, but we have this guy here, cited one, that is highly, highly upregulated. And this is um, very interesting because this cited one is, is also called MSG1, melanocyte-specific gene one, which was first characterized in, in the melanocytic lineage. So we see that in our uh, metastatic samples of our, our patients, Cited one is very highly expressed using immunohistochemistry, but if we look at the TCGA database that will tell us the survival uh, probability, patients that have very high levels of cited are also going uh, to have a worse <coughs> prognosis. So is cited, again, associated with contractile cells in vivo? We can see that the more rounded you are, the more cited you express, and this is particularly prominent in the invasive fronts of tumors in, in a mouse model. But if we look in humans, we see exactly the same. Cited is very highly upregulated in the invasive fronts, and it nicely correlates with um, roundness. And I don't show you this, but it was even a better correlation if you just look at cited in the nucleus when, when it's active, really. So what does cited do? If we remove it from the cells, again, we lose the roundness, the contractility, but we can do the op we can play around with the pathway. We can give TGF beta to cells, they round up, they gain contractility, they start making blebs, and they activate a SMAD driven transcription. But if we remove cited, this adapter molecule, they no longer can do any of this. So what is cited doing? We thought it might be regulating genes that promote actomyosin contractility. And that's the case. So we did a bit more transcriptomics. We gave TGF beta to the cells. We removed cited one. And we looked at putative regulators of contractility. And we found that they are highly regulated by cited. So some of these genes we already suspected regulate contractility, like LIF or IL-11, which are IL-6 <coughs> uh, cytokines, or JAK. But we found some new regulators like this GEF. And indeed, if you remove these, these uh, uh, genes after TGF beta stimulation, we lose the roundness and we lose the activity of uh, myosin 2. Is it functionally relevant to have or not to have cited? So when melanomas 
invade, they need to lose interactions with the keratinocytes that are surrounding uh, uh, their, their niche. So when we give TGF beta to cells, they lose attachment with keratinocytes, but this is no longer true if we don't have the SMAD cited complex. If we now test what the melanoma cells need to do, which is migrate and invade, TGF beta will stimulate the migration and the invasion, but not if you don't have this transcriptional complex between cited and SMAD. And the next thing they need to do, they need to reach blood vessels and disseminate. So if we give TGF beta, they will attach better to the blood vessels, but not if they don't have cited. And when they are tested, if they can survive in the lung and colonize it, if we give TGF beta, there is an improvement, but if they don't have cited, this is very much reduced, and we think it's because you're downregulating all these genes that control actomyosin contractility. So I would like to summarize um, all the data I've shown you today. And I think we've done quite a good job identifying extracellular signals that are chemical mediators, cytokines, and uh, um, growth factors that will be integrated by the cytoskeleton of the cell, will activate specific transcription factors that will feed back into sustaining contractility. And I think this is a very efficient way of sustaining migration over time. We also have identified some kind of stop signals, like reactive oxygen species and P53. So we don't want to kind of promote that, that uh, this is gone, so we shouldn't be uh, taking antioxidants if we don't want um, the cancer cells to migrate. And then uh, another interesting uh, observation comes about here, because during tumor progression, it's quite frequent that P53 will become inactivated and you will gain function on, on these transcription factors. So we think this crosstalk of the cytoskeleton and these transcription factors will have many more roles, not just controlling cell migration. And with this, um, I would like to finish, and uh, if you're interested in any of the things you've heard today and you're looking for a job, maybe talk to me later. And uh, last but not least, I want to uh, say thanks to a whole lot of people. Uh, my collaborators or our collaborators today, I've talked about the work we've done with Sophia, Richard, Eric, Rosa Maria Martí, who provided the, many uh, patient samples, and Isabel Fabregat. But of course, we have plenty of collaborators that we're very grateful to. This medal goes to my lab because they are the ones that have done all the work. And this is a fantastic bunch of people, motivated, hardworking, enthusiastic, and, and I love them to bits. <laughs> These are the past lab members and the current lab members. And, and I think they, they are incredible and they have a, a really good future ahead of them. And I also want to thank the funding bodies because they actually make it possible, and especially Cancer Research UK uh, for believing in me. And there is another set of three people I'm very grateful to, and this is uh, my PhD supervisor, Piero Crespo Baraja, who taught me how to do molecular biology and study signaling. My postdoc supervisor, Chris Marshall, who taught me how to use my molecular biology skills into cells, and I learned how to do cell biology, and tumor biology, and that was really a fantastic combination. And last but not least, Anne Ridley, who is here today, and she's been my mentor during my career development fellowship, and she's been such a wonderful mentor. I'm so grateful. I also want to thank my family, because they're very supportive, <laughs> very understanding, and, uh, you know, they just have to cope with me, <laughs> especially my husband, Frederick, and my son, Oliver, because not only they're supportive, they're very patient. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for listening.